Morning Freedom Church. Good to be with you today for another kitchen teaching. Um, less of a teaching today, more of a conversation, I suppose. It's been a really tough couple of weeks for all of us, I suppose. The news from October the 7th, this incredibly evil event that took place in southern Israel. And um, it's been really shocking. And as someone, myself and other people who are, you know, have a real heart for the Jewish people, it's been very painful to, to see and hear what's been going on. Um, shocking events, utterly, utterly shocking. So I just want to share my heart a bit on that today. Um, and then I want to bring in a story at the end, which I think is relevant again, which I shared at the camp we had this summer. But I want to reshare it because I think it's just so important and so many of you didn't hear it. So these events that have happened over the last few days are obviously just, they're just deplorable. They're just uh, they're, they're demonic. It's been utterly awful to hear. But I want to just explain that we as Christians need to support the Jewish people and pray for them. And they're not perfect. No nation is perfect. But I'd like to read to you some scriptures and particularly from Ezekiel 36 to begin with, just explaining what the Lord's plan is for his people. Because remember that Jesus is a Jew and it's through the Jews, through Judah, through the word Judah, we get the word Jew. It's through the Judah line, the line of Judah, that we get the lion of Judah, Jesus Christ, through that list and line of kings we have Jesus our saviour and he is a Jew he's the lion of the tribe of Judah from which we get that word Jew so what's God's plan for the Jews why is this happening and we can't go too deeply into it we haven't got the time but I'd like to read from Ezekiel 36 starting at verse 22 therefore give the people of Israel this message from the sovereign Lord I am bringing you back but not because you deserve it I am doing it to protect my holy name so God is bringing back the Jewish people to their land. We had that nation, the scriptures say, can a nation be born in one day? And of course, Israel was born in one day, 1948, bang, Israel was born. A nation again in one day. It's a miraculous time. It's a miracle that took place. I'm doing it to protect my holy name on which you brought shame while you were scattered among the nations. The Jewish people have been scattered for centuries, thousands of years, a couple of thousand years nearly. Um, I will show how holy my great name is, the name which you brought shame among the nations. And when I reveal my holiness through you before their very eyes, says the sovereign Lord, then the nations will know that I am the Lord. For I will gather you up from all the nations and bring you home again to your land. And we must remember that the land that the Jewish people live in, the land of Israel, is God's chosen land for his people. It, it, it's a covenant promise. It is their land. It isn't anybody else's. It is their land. God promised it to Abraham, Isaac and Jacob. It is their land. It's the Jewish people's land. They have nowhere else to go. So God is going to bring them back after they've been scattered across the nation since, since the Romans destroyed them in AD 70 or whenever it was. Um, then when they come back to their land, then I will sprinkle clean water on you, on the Jewish people, and you will be clean. Your filth will be washed away. And by the way, we're just as filthy as Gentiles, as, as you know, as non-Jews. We need the salvation of Christ to cleanse us as well. Your filth will be washed away and you will no longer worship idols. And I will give you a new heart and I will put my spirit in you and I will take out your stony, stubborn heart and give you tender, a tender and responsive heart. And they have traditionally had a very stubborn heart, the Jewish people, for, for God. But they don't want to have anything. They've not wanted to have anything to do with the Messiah, Jesus. They rejected him. But in the last probably 20, 30, 40 years, there's been a real almost explosion of Messianic Jews coming through. Um, Paul tells us in the New Testament, you know, as the fullness of the Gentiles come in, so all Israel will be saved. And, and you know, it's, it's, it's as if there's like that balancing as the Gentiles come in then Israel will be saved. And more and more Jewish people are coming to their, to their saviour Jesus in these modern times. It's incredible, really. You could count on one hand in the 40s and 50s how many Messianic Jews there were in Israel. And now there are thousands and thousands of incredible ministries out there as well. It's an incredible miracle and it's a prophecy coming true. Um, and I will put my spirit in you so that you will follow my decrees and be careful to obey my regulations. And you will live in, 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 in Israel, the land I gave your ancestors long ago. You will be my people and I will be your God. There is a promise. I will cleanse you of your filthy behaviour. 
I will give you good crops of grain and I will send no more famines on the land. And they have had a real blessing recently, you know, the last 50, 60 years, they've turned what was essentially just a desert land into a fruitful, fruitful nation. I will give you great harvests from your fruit trees and fields and never again will the surrounding nations be able to scoff at your land for its famines. And then you will remember your past sins and, despi- uh, sins and despise yourselves for all the detestable things that you did. But remember, says the sovereign Lord, I am not doing this because you deserve it. Oh, my people Israel, you should be utterly ashamed of what you have done. He says he's doing it because of his great pain. And we all, we all, you know, we all just like the Jewish people have fallen short of the glory of God. We know that scripture, but God, you know, God brought Jesus into this world to save us from that sin, save us from those shameful ways. And it's just as true for the Jewish people as it is for us, the Gentiles. So there's, the, there's that promise, they're coming back. And I think at this time where we have this horrendous terrorism going on, utter terrorism going on by Hamas. By the way, the word Hamas in, in, in Hebrew means violence. It means to take by violence. It's exactly what they do. It's all about violence. There's no, there's no regard for human life. Human life is not sacred. Unfortunately, they just regard it as empty, futile. They're not interested. They're just, they're just interested in violence. They're not interested in peace. Hamas isn't interested in peace. They're interested in, they say in their own constitution, if you like, that their, their goal is to wipe Israel off the map. And you can't, you can't have peace with that. You can't make peace with that kind of ideology. It's just impossible. So it's an ongoing feud and it all goes back to, to Abraham's two sons. And we have Ishmael, we have Isaac and Ishmael. And Ishmael went off and God said, I will bless you as well. You'll be a mighty nation, which the Arabs are a mighty nation. Of course, they've got lots of oil and there's lots of wealth in certain parts of it. But there's this constant feud going on. There's been this constant battle going on between Ishmael and Isaac. And there's tensions up and down throughout the centuries, constant wars, constant um, anti-Semitism. It's just it's just been there and it's going to be there until the time Jesus returns. So we have to understand that. That's what's happening. It's a spiritual battle. It's been going on for centuries and centuries. Um, Anyway, where was I going with that? So we had this awful situation, but, you know, God God is going to bring back the Jewish people because anti-Semitism is going to rise up now because of what's going on. So God will now inevitably bring back. It says in scriptures, I will, I can't remember the exact verse, but I will, I will, I'll bring the hunters out to bring you back. I will hunt you out to bring you back. You know, they've got to come back to their land as we've just read. They're going to come back to their land, the land of Israel. Many of them have, it's called making Aliyah. It means returning back to the Jewish homeland for the Jews, but there's still millions of Jews yet to return to Israel. But each time something like this happens, the planes come in and people move back to the land of Israel for safety and for shelter because anti-Semitism rises because the spirit of the age is so anti-Semitic, anti-Jew hatred effectively is what it means, that they feel they have to come back to their homeland. So they will start to come back. And when they come back, and when the fullness of the Israelites come back into their land, then Jesus says in that Ezekiel 36, he says, then I will wash you clean when you're back in your land. So we can't expect them to be perfect yet, but one day the Lord will wash them clean. He says in verse 25, then, that's when you come home again, the verse before, I'll bring you home again to your land. Then I will sprinkle clean water on you. And I've heard Christians say it can't be the Lord bringing them back. It can't be the, the Lord can't be in this because if he was in this, the Jews would be believers in the land of Israel. No, no, no. They don't know the scriptures. Then when you're back in your land, then I will sprinkle clean water on you and you will be clean. Your filth will be washed away. So we have to respect that and understand that and pray for it. You know, pray, Lord, Lord, we pray that you bring your people back. You know, set the world in order for your return, as I always pray. Set the world in order for your return. And that's one of the promises that we can pray into is that the, the Jewish people come back to their land so they can be washed clean. Um, just a word on this um, evil evil terrorist organisation, Hamas. You know, I, I, I was thinking the other day, I, I actually I began to cry as I was reading a news story and I... I saw the video pop up of a, because obviously there was many hostages taken back to to uh, to Gaza, and I saw a video of a, a one year old boy, just just over one, um, had been taken hostage back to Gaza, and and just the way they were treating him, I had to turn the video off, but couldn't, couldn't watch it. But the way they were treating this one year old, I just began to cry. I just thought, I don't know how 
I just, my conscience could not allow me to just do anything like that. I just, to any of it, any of that terrorism, just, and you'll all be the same. You know, we're believers in the Lord, but we, we are washed clean. You know, we're, we're clothed in righteousness and our conscience just cannot allow us to go there. We can't commit rape and murder and, and all that evil and burning people alive in their homes. It was just horrendous what's happened to the Jewish people. We just can't do that. Our consciences are just in the way. We just, we just cannot, we just can't, we just literally can't do that. And I was thinking about this, thinking, Lord, what's happening? How can they do this? You know, this is so evil. And my attention turned to Titus. And I remembered that scripture about the conscience and what it means. And it's in Titus 1, and we'll read it from verse 15. Titus 1, 15. Everything is pure to those whose hearts are pure, but nothing, zero, nil, nothing is pure to those who are corrupt and unbelieving because their minds and their consciences are corrupt, completely corrupt. They've completely seared it, other versions would say, you know, seared conscience. There's nothing in their conscience which can can flag up to say this is wrong. It's just deception and a completely seared conscience. And we just cannot understand how they think in that in that faith and that religion in that area. We, 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 it's so different to the Western mindset, even, you know, it's just their mindset is very, very different. It's very different. It's hard to understand how they think. Training young, young toddler boys to hate Jewish, the Jewish race and to kill them if they see them, if they ever get the chance. They're trained to do that. They're told to do that from two, three, four years old, given toy weapons to replicate it. You know, the, the hatred runs so deep, but it's spiritual. You know, we're not fighting against flesh and blood. There's a spirit behind it within these people, within that group. There's a spirit behind it, which is driving them into this, um, into the hatred for the Jewish people. And I remember, I can't remember who said it, but I remember some preacher was asked a question. And the, the guy who asked the question said, you know, sir, what's the best evidence for God? And the preacher replied, the Jewish people. And when you think, and, and then he expanded on that, but when you think about it, it's true because every prophecy comes true. And just the, the natural hatred for God's people, for his people, the natural hatred, which is just in people, it's just there. People just hate the Jewish people. They don't even know why. There's, there's protests going on globally against the Jewish people. You get were massacred. The Holocaust, we've had the Holocaust. We've had, it's their land. It's been their land ever since Abraham. And yet people want them out and English people and Americans and all these, you know, New York, London or Paris, all these, all these huge protests with people just, just, you know, asking for Israel to be wiped away or to cease fire and to leave it all alone and just go away and get out and give the Palestinians, you know, they say they chant from the river to the sea, Palestine will be free, those type of things, which essentially means just destroy Israel and give the Palestinians back all of their so-called land, which is not their land. Um, we can go into that another time, the history of that, but it's, it runs so deep, it runs so deep, this hatred, this spiritual hatred, which is just within people, it's incredible to see. Anyway, we also have the scriptures, Jesus says, doesn't he, that people, there'll come a time where people will kill you in my name, for my name, as if it's for God. And they're deceived, they're completely deceived. And that's exactly what we see in this modern time is they, they're doing it thinking they're pleasing God when, of course, they're not they're pleasing the enemy. That's who they're pleasing. I want to just turn to Luke 21 and read this scripture for us. So Luke chapter 21, we'll go from verse 16. Even those closest to you, your parents, brothers, relatives and friends will betray you. This is talking about the end time, towards the end of the days, which we're living in. They will even kill some of you and everyone will hate you because you are my followers. But not a hair on your head will perish. By standing firm, you will win your souls. So this hatred is there and it's coming. This is, I want to come to this point where it's not just for the Jews. You know, Paul said in Romans 1, for the Jew first and also to the Greek. And that truth kind of runs true. And I remember the late, great Derek Prince saying, um, about that scripture to the Jew first and also to the Greek. I remember him saying, and when I think of that scripture, my mind turns to the Holocaust and then I shudder. Because if that could happen to the Jews first, what about us, the non-Jew? 
you know, it's not suggesting that we're going to have a holocaust in the same way. I'm not suggesting that. And that's what Derek was getting at. But he was saying that we have to be careful because principally it seems to be that what happens to the Jews inevitably turns to the believers in the Jewish Messiah, in Jesus. And there is a rise, there is a hatred for Christianity now, which is growing exponentially. And there's no protests for the poor Africans being slaughtered by Boko Haram. You know, in North Africa, there's, you know, where's the protest for that? Thousands and thousands of Christians being beheaded and killed, women, children taken as sex slaves. Yet there's no protest for that because it doesn't, it's not, you know, in people's hearts, the spirit of the age is all against the Jewish people. You know, there's no, there's nothing coming against that side of terrorism. You don't hear about it, but it's happening so often particularly in Africa at the moment, but of course all over the world. So we have to be prepared. Jesus has warned us that this can happen and it can be our own family and friends will betray you, he says, and they will even kill some of you. So, you know, it's not all sort of being doom and gloom, but we just have to read the words of Jesus and accept that, okay, Lord, that, you know, I have to pray into that and be, be understanding of the scriptures and understand that this world is going to be a very difficult place for, for so many of us. And I think that's probably coming in the next few years. Um, it already is to an extent. You can't preach on the streets of England anymore without being arrested most of the time. It's um, it's slowly coming, so we have to be very careful and watchful. You know, Jesus said, watch and pray, and we need to watch what's going on. We need to watch what's going on in the world and pray that we're able to endure to the end. Jesus said, he who endures to the end shall be saved. Now, in light of all of that, in light of all this hatred going on and everything that's going on for the Jewish people, for Christians, I want to turn to that story that I spoke about at camp, the Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego. Three Jewish boys with Daniel and the rest of the Israelites were taken away captive by the Babylonians, by King Nebuchadnezzar. And anyway, Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego, very clever guys, handsome, clever guys, you know, Nebuchadnezzar, you know, chose the best of the bunch of the Jews to, to come and serve in his palace, if you like. Daniel being one of them, of course, as well. And you remember the story, and we all sort of speak that story, and it's a lovely children's story as well. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego went to the fire, and they, they came out unharmed, and it was all hunky-dory, and, and there was no fear and stuff, but, you know, no anxiety. It was all, it was all sort of done, but, but that's just a fairy tale, really. Now you're thinking, no, it isn't just scripture. Well, yes, it is scripture, but there was serious, serious torment. You've got Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, who had... Incredible wealth, huge reserves of money in the bank, living in the best of the best area in the palace, um, in charge over this, that, the other, high standing with King Nebuchadnezzar, safety in his presence, loved by him, liked by him, um, respected by the king. And then they're told, you need to bow down to the statue, the gold statue that Nebuchadnezzar's making. And if you don't, you're going to be killed. And can you imagine the anguish in Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego? You know, that, that anguish, that, that, oh my gosh, guys, we, we can't do this. We cannot deny our father in heaven. We can't deny the true God of Israel. You imagine them going home to their wives or their children and saying, hi, love, a tough day today. You know, the wife says, well, what's happened? You know, Shadrach says to his wife, Nebuchadnezzar is building a gold statue and he wants us to bow down to him. And the wife says, well, I'll just bow down. It's, you've told us that these gods aren't real anyway. You can just bow down to it and just be done with it. Nobody will notice. Just do a little little bow, just a little one, and just come back home to your family. And Shadrach says, I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to bow. And the wife says, you know, but, you, but, but you're going to be killed. You're going to be burnt alive. You can't do this to us. You know, when I think of that myself, you know, as, as, a, as a father and most of your mothers and fathers, you know, you imagine that situation and think, oh, the anguish that you'd go through, you know, the absolute agony of heart and spirit to go through. You'd be going through knowing that you're facing death and potentially leaving your family and friends and everything else behind because you won't bow. So anyway, they obviously went along to the statue, marched down there. I don't know where Daniel was at this point, he's not mentioned, but Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego stood there and then the symphony orchestra of the time, or whatever it was, and Nebuchadnezzar had played the music and that's when everyone had to bow and a sea of people bow down to the spirit of the age, to the demonic, to this, to this false god, to this, 
this false religion. And they all bow down as Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego to stand up, bolt upright. And their hearts must have been going like that. You know, they must have been boom, 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 because they know what's coming. And of course, they're seen. Nebuchadnezzar's told those three aren't bowing. They're not bowing. So Nebuchadnezzar's furious, absolutely furious. And he throws them, orders them to be thrown into that fiery furnace, which is so hot, it kills some of the soldiers as they're, as they're throwing the guys in. Imagine the agony of heart as they're being marched into it, dragged into it, being led to their death. Much like these Jewish people held hostage who have been taken away from their land, from their family members, the agony, the, the emotional torment and agony must be overwhelming, whether you're a Christian or not. I don't know how people could, well, I don't think you could cope with it. So with the Lord's help, potentially, but I don't even know. I'll just be honest. I mean, the agony there is unbelievable being taken hostage. But so they're thrown into this place, the agony of heart. And they do come out alive. They told Nebuchadnezzar, even if you throw us in, we trust our Lord and he can save us. And even if he doesn't save us, we're not going to bow down to your statue. And I really sort of to this summer dwell on that story as I was reading through Daniel, the book of Daniel, because you read that story pretty quickly. I think great story, but just got me really thinking, you know, wow, you know, that was such an incredible feat of endurance of heart and, and emotion and determination and willpower and faith in their God to face death in those circumstances when they could have just done a little tiny bow, you know, or something like that to get away with it, which so many were doing. It got me thinking, you know, but I was a Christian, you know, am I willing to stand up for what I believe in? Am I willing to stand up for the Jewish people in love and prayer? Or do I just sort of bow to the current, current spirit of the age? You know, am I willing to stand up for what I believe in when it comes to sex and sexuality? as my girls go to school? Or am I gonna just lightly bow and just say, oh, it's okay, I can't face the repercussions? You know, am I gonna stand tall when they do come at me and hate you because of the name of Jesus, as Jesus said in, in, in that Luke 21? You know, they'll hate you because they hated me, Jesus said as well. You know, am I gonna stand up? Or am I gonna to bow to the spirit of the age? You know, do I have that strength of character that Jesus is looking for? And he's looking for it, he's looking for his bride. And he's not going to come back tomorrow, the Lord, because the bride isn't ready. The bride's got to be ready, but righteous and ready for his return with our lamps filled with oil, filled with the spirit. And we're not quite ready yet, the church. I don't believe we're ready yet, the church as a whole. And I just think, wow, you know, can I stand against the spirit of the age with my head held high? with the risk of being killed or the risk of being jailed or, or whatever else. I, I remember speaking to Dave Steele along these lines a few years back, and he just said it um, quite flippantly. He just said, oh yeah, I fully expect to be martyred. I fully expect to be martyred. And he said, what a way to die. What an amazing way to die. And I was like, yeah, I'm not there yet, Dave. I'm not there yet. And he was saying that as a dad of, at the time, three kids. So, you know, it just, um, I don't know, when push comes to shove and, you know, you're actually, you're actually in that moment. We have to hope and pray that we stand tall. So that's my, my finishing point really is, you know, are you willing? That's my question really for discussion is, are you willing and are you ready to stand up for what you believe in? Just like the Jewish people do, you know, they stand up for what they believe in, be them saved or not. They know who they are. They protect themselves. They want to be a Jewish people. They want to live in their land and stand against the enemy. They don't want to give in. And there's a lot to learn from that, from their steely determination. And I think, can we stand up as Christians and stand on what we believe in, in our workplace? Some of you are teachers in your school. Some of you work in hospitals or other environments or wherever you work in office, offices. Will you stand tall like Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego? Or will you bow to the spirit of the age? because things are declining very rapidly and we're starting to shine brighter because of what we believe in, but we're also becoming more of a target. So that's my question to you today is will you stand or will you bow? God bless you guys. See you soon.